yes um, i think maybe we can start okay perfect thank you very much uh, vat um, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen colleagues warm welcome from bangkok to this workshop on building forward better securing inclusive resilient and green development in indonesia um, this is a part of our ongoing effort in helping member states on three fronts one um, we have been trying to think about uh, policy packages that can help them recover better from the impacts of the or multifaceted impacts of the covid-19 pandemic uh, number two, we want this kind of recovery to take place in a manner that is consistent with the ambitions of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And number three, as countries think about implementing some of the policy options that we have discussed, um, there are going to be fiscal policy or debt implications uh, as they move forward. So they need to be aware of what can be done on those fronts as well. This is actually part of our research, which was published in April 2021 in our flagship uh, report, Economic and Social Survey of Asia and the Pacific. And uh, it was a regional report, of course, we discovered from uh, in the report, we discussed from the regional perspective, what are the broad contours of the policy packages that we have been um, um, uh, highlighting around three broad areas providing social services, reducing divid uh, digital dividend, uh, digital gaps, and focusing on green development aspects. And within that, of course, there were multiple sub areas that were discussed. But since then, based on the country request, we have been working in partnership with several uh, country uh, ministries, with UNRCs uh, across, I think, so far, we have worked with about six countries in trying to alter the model for those countries' specific circumstances, highlighting their policy uh, scenarios and priorities and so so on so, and so forth. So this is today we are going to talk about and learn about Indonesia. Um, we'll be starting, it will be a, it's a two day workshop. So we'll be starting soon with the opening session. And we are very honored to have been joined by our executive secretary, uh, Ms. Armida Alis Jabana, who will be delivering her opening remarks in a minute. Then we are joined our colleague, uh, colleague and friend, uh, Ms. Valerie Julian. She is the United Nations resident coordinator in Indonesia leading our efforts, uh, of UN's efforts in Indonesia. And we are very honored and actually personally very pleased to welcome Ms. Amalia Vidyasanti, the Deputy Minister for Economic Affairs, Ministry of National Development Planning. She has been working with ASCAF for several years now and has actually taken a lead in several of the initiatives we have worked in the recent past with Indonesia. So very warm welcome to these distinguished uh, participants for the opening session. After the opening session, we'll have, we'll move on to more specifics. So session two, for instance, we'll be talking about building Indonesia forward better, policy options and implications. My colleague uh, Rohimath will be actually moderating that session. We'll be get a little more into the specifics of uh, what is going on in, in, in Indonesia, what are the policy thinking, what are the plans, what, are, what can be done, what they intend to do especially keeping in view the G20 presidency that Indonesia currently holds. Uh, session three will be, of course, uh, uh, opening the floor for questions and answer, answers and learning from the participants uh, what more can be done. And then tomorrow, of course, we'll get into the specific, a very technical session on nitty gritty of a modeling framework that our ex-colleague and good friend Don Holland has been working on in developing a macroeconometric model um, so she'll be talking briefly in session two today also, but tomorrow we'll take the participants through this modeling exercise, how such a modeling tool can be used in Indonesia to learn about different policy scenarios and their implications. So with this brief intro, let me invite um, uh, Ms. Armida Alizjabana, Executive Secretary of ASCAP, to share her opening remarks. Yes, the floor is yours, madam. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Hamza. Very good afternoon uh, to all colleagues here, especially to Ibu Amalia Adininga Widiasanti, Ibu Wini, Deputy Minister for Economic or for Economy, Economic Affairs, yeah, but uh, to my colleague uh, Ibu Valerie, Ibu Valerie, UNRC Indonesia, and also to colleagues here, teman-teman, especially from Kementerian PPN Bapenas, yeah as well as understand maybe also, aside from Bapenas, uh, a few colleagues also from other ministry or agency uh, taking part in this workshop. So it is indeed my great pleasure to welcome you to this workshop on policies to build forward better together in Indonesia. 
jointly co-organized by BAPANAS, uh, us and as well as uh, the country team. Uh, as you know, uh, we are now entering already third year yeah, of COVID-19 pandemic, past already past two years, and the world is still grappling, although we've seen uh, quite some positive signs, but uh, not sure yeah, whether we are uh, uh, in the direction of um, uh, coming out yeah, of this crisis, yeah? but hopefully so. But again, the socioeconomic impact has been tremendous, has been very severe globally as well as regional and of course, yeah, at the country level. Uh, the past two years, yeah, what we've seen, a country's government have concentrated their effort to mitigate, uh, basically to mitigate the socioeconomic impact of the crisis of, of COVID-19. Uh, and at the same time, also to ramp up measures uh, how to better protect uh, the population by uh, accelerating the vaccination uh, and, and all that diagnostic as well as uh, therapeutics. Yeah? Uh, and, and we've seen also, and now uh, I think um, several countries in Africa yeah, will receive this access yeah, to the mRNA vaccine. Yeah? But at the same time, as uh, we see is our challenge, development challenge is not only the pandemic, at the same time ongoing and even yeah, even now being accessible further, uh, the climate change, the latest IPCC report, right, uh, shows clearly, right, clearly that we are in the wrong track. And for our region, for our region, an added challenge, challenge or challenges is with regard to the, the, the disaster, natural disaster. So at, at some instances, yeah, these three so-called uh, triple source yeah, of uh, crisis, if you uh, would like to say that, yeah, can exacerbate further one another. And now, especially the past, how many days now? A little bit more over than a week now, yeah? Uh, closing into uh, soon to be two weeks yet, yeah? we've seen with great concern the evolving uh, crisis or, or, or war yeah? uh, in, especially in Europe uh, with regard to Ukraine and Russia, which again, we see it has driven uh, oil price, especially oil price here. Yeah? I just uh, saw this morning, how much? 130, 130 dollar per barrel already, yeah? oil price, right? Uh, and I remember uh, the last time when I was still in government, colleagues in Bapanas here, I'm sure you remember, right? At that time, at that time, right? Uh, the uh, oil price hit 120, that was the, the highest, 120 and we were, <laughs> we were uh, in, in, in much trouble, yeah? So now 130. Not to mention other price, wheat and other minerals and so on, of course, yeah, and we do not know for how long. Yeah. Then uh, when this COVID has not yet received, receded, we have to encounter another, another, this is big, yeah, large scale crisis. Yeah. So again, yeah, in terms of, uh, again, a majority of you are in this planning, right, in Bapanas how you, you can catch up yeah, with all this quick development. And at the same time, uh, you are uh, having this exercise to have this longer term view, right? You, 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 you are doing all this exercise with regard to this economic transformation exercise here, yeah? economic transformation exercise, which is a very long term view. So we are talking about 2045, we are talking about 2045 or even beyond 2050. Yeah. So again, uh, to put it all this in perspective, yeah. Again, all these challenges, right? Uh, we have another one, right? We 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 used to uh, until recently think okay, three major development challenges that I mentioned earlier, but now plus one, plus one, yeah. 
So you, we need, especially colleagues in Bapanas and Indonesia, then you need to start to how to, to take all this into account, short term, medium term, as well as long term. But for sure, for sure, yes, several elements, yeah, needs to be uh, take into account or into consideration. First is how to build, how to build a resiliency, more resilient. Yeah, with regard to pandemic, climate change, climate action, and also inclusiveness. Yeah, the society needs, the economy needs to be more resilient. So resiliency plus inclusiveness, inclusiveness. And uh, added to that is, of course, uh, in the recovery and onwards, of course, yeah, we need to be more sustainable. Then you need to translate what does sustainable mean, uh, sustainability means, right? Is it only green economy, green blue economy, or what, <laughs> right? And how, how this will also link to the uh, climate change, climate action, yeah, that all countries need to contribute and towards the net zero emission around, um, around the middle of the century, yeah? So ideally, in 2050, but some countries apparently you need more time you have to reach that commitment. And we also know two more elements, which are financing. And now with the prolonged uh, crisis or COVID, yeah, uh, which is uh, prolonged, yeah, entering its third year, then it has certainly huge impact ramification, including the increased step debt level or debt issues. But luckily for Indonesia, because uh, Indonesia, you know, this uh, two sides of the coin, yeah? At one, one, one a challenge is because of the increase in all these commodity, oil price rise and so, so forth. But on the other hand, because yeah, of the revenue still uh, derives or generated from this, this exact uh, sources, then you have a, I think it's still positive, yeah. The net balance is still positive, right? So you, Indonesia is not impacted as such, yeah, in terms of a fiscal uh, position, yeah. But again, overall, the other countries are impacted by the debt issue, and therefore, again, financing needs to be one of priority. What kind of innovative financing, uh, and also, uh, you know, this domestic resource mobilization, more efficient in the expenditure of budget expenditure policy and so on. And last but not least is, of course, the digital transformation. Yeah. Digital transformation, uh, if we could benefit it uh, greatly, then uh, we could also, I mean, countries, yeah, societies could also utilize or benefit uh, from the digital transformation to transform the society and the economy. Yeah. But uh, this needs uh, a medium to longer term uh, planning. So I hope all these elements, all these elements can be uh, taken into account when uh, you uh, started to do the exercise in the modeling yeah, for the medium, short, medium, and the long term. And hopefully then Indonesia can have uh, a plan yeah, on how to go forward in the longer term to reach that uh, eventual goal of a more sustainable, green, and inclusive uh, economy and society. So with that, I stop. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, again, uh, to Ibu Wini, to Bapanas, yeah, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Ibu Amida, for putting things in context and, how, and highlighting actually the very latest emerging challenges in the shape of uh, conflict that we are seeing. Uh, and its ramifications for socioeconomic development going forward. Rising commodity prices is one very immediate uh, imp visible impact of that, but there are going to be more complications down the line. So yes, indeed, it's a challenging world we're living in. Our modeling approach is one way to try and assess from multiple angles how to provide, how to move multiple fronts while providing social services, digital transformation and green development, what can be done. And I think one uh, value addition for our, our work is, which we hope to uh, work closely with Indonesian colleagues and for sure is 
trying to shun this old notion that policymakers should primarily focus on economic growth per se, and once they achieve that, then pay attention to other considerations. Uh, our model formally shows that long-term pure economic growth potential, as well as other benefits social on the social environmental fronts can be delivered, can be had if you move in a certain deliberate manner. Um, so anyway, so let's learn to our next distinguished uh, speaker for this opening session, Ms. Valerie Julian. She is the United Nations Resident Coordinator in Indonesia. Valerie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and salamat sorry. Good afternoon. Of course, Ibuwini, Amalia, Widyasanti, Deputy Minister for Economic Affairs, Bapenas. Warm greetings also to Ibu Armida, uh, Executive Secretary, ESCAP. To you, Hamza, Hamza Malik, Chief of Service Economic Affairs, ESCAP, and to all the distinguished speakers, panelists, representative from the government of Indonesia, UN colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to be here with, uh, with uh, Ibu Wini and Ibu Armida today to open this uh, national workshop on securing inclusive, resilient, green development in Indonesia. And it's also great to know that uh, in this workshop, we have not only government participants, but also we have a uh, representative from the development partners and across academia. But I would say a bit along the line of what uh, Ibu Armida mentioned, I think that uh, I, I, it would be remiss not to address the horrific conflicts still escalating in Ukraine. You know, nowadays it's difficult, whatever we do, not to uh, go to that uh, situation. And I must say all the scenes that we have seen uh, on television of the human suffering in Ukraine, but also in Myanmar, in Yemen, in Tigray and elsewhere, all of this reminds us that socioeconomic gains of decades of development work can be undone in just days and weeks by armed conflict. So as we see around the world, there is a huge wave of solidarity with the civilians that are suffering in Ukraine as the result of the armed conflict. But let us make sure that we all reaffirm our commitment to building peace, justice, and strong institution, because sustainable development is simply not possible without them. So we will hear today from uh, Ibu Wini um, how Indonesia aims to transform its economy, and we'll hear about the different strategy. And I want to say that uh, as UN, and as, as Ibu Amida mentioned, of course, we stand ready to support those strategies and including through conducting economic transformation analysis for Indonesia that we are going to discuss today. But I want to really commend BAPENA's leadership in this uh, national economic transformation effort to, to put really the green and the inclusive comp component at the heart of it. And I really applaud the government of Indonesia to make sure that also the green and blue economies are among the priority issues in the G20 discussion, and especially in the development working group that is actually chaired by BAPENAS. And I want to say that um, it is important, this putting the green and the blue economy at the center of the debate is as important as what Indonesia decided to do in its presidency of the G20, which was, and which is, to represent the interest of the least uh, developed nation. And that is really commendable. And I must say the fact also that the government aims to achieve a net, net zero by 2060 or sooner is also commendable. So as you know, colleague, um, with Indonesia in the process of designing its next national medium, medium term and long term development plan that we call by their initial RPJMN and RPJ, RPJPN, I think there, it, it cannot be a better time than now to ensure that all our macroeconomic policies are socially inclusive and ecologically sustainable. And as Amsa was, this, was saying, too long we have been considering that only the economic component was important. And I would say with what is happening around the world nowadays, we know that we ju just cannot leave on the side the social dimension and the environmental dimension. So this is what we are going to reflect upon today. Uh, during this workshop, we will look at the finding of this macroeconomic modeling exercise that actually assesses the social, economic, and environmental impact of green development initiative in Indonesia. And we're going to look at especially the top, the carbon tax and the fiscal transfers and the way they can be used to preserve forest cover 
uh, in Indonesia. But to kick us off, I thought that I could share with you some intriguing findings from this modeling exercise. First, the introduction of the carbon tax in April 20, 2021. Uh, this has the potential to generate a lot of fiscal revenue, around 5 billion uh, per, per, uh, per year, which actually can be channeled towards social protection, health and energy, uh, um, energy efficiency. But the carbon tax can do this while encouraging a decline, albeit a marginal decline, in greenhouse gas emission. So that is very important. Secondly, the combination of a green economy scenario with a fiscal transfer scheme to preserve the, for the forest cover and the introduction of a carbon tax all together can really deliver very important environmental returns and at the same time support economic activity and social progress. And third, introducing a carbon tax while maintaining carbon linked subsidies, this can send mixed messages to the public and may delay the phasing out of fossil fuels. So these, were these are interesting findings that certainly we're going to discuss today. But I would like to highlight that to, su to successfully transition towards a green economy and especially a net zero emission economy requires the activation of employment and social protection policies that work in tandem with this ecological transformation. And these must include policies to help workers keep or change their job and adapt to the green and digital transition. But it also requires that we expand the investment in social protection floors to make sure that the vulnerable population are not left behind during that transition. Because too often those populations are left behind, whether we are going up or whether we are going down, whether we transition, often those populations are left behind. This is a priority in whatever we do to ensure that they are not left behind. And we have really more than enough platform to broadcast our commitment towards the green economy. And as I mentioned, the G20 is one of them, but also the COP26 has been really important. And it's really vital that those commitments lead to concrete action because we cannot stay at the level of the rhetoric. Our actions have to match our words. And we are in a position here in Indonesia to really take these actions through the commitment and the leadership of BAPENAS and number of uh, government entity, but also with studies like the ESCAPS modeling exercise, because it helps in ensuring that whatever we do, it is evidence-based. So we are very grateful for BAPENAS leadership and guidance on this uh, journey towards an economic transformation, but also for the very invaluable expertise that ESCAP has provided. And I think that somewhat today's event, we can say, is a testament to the efficacy of the UN reform, where the entire UN reform is at the disposal of member states, in that case, Indonesia. And it means that Indonesia can benefit from the expertise of all UN entities, whether they reside or not in the country like it is the case of ESCAP being a non-resident agency. And this, all this has been facilitated by my office and I can tell you it's a great privilege to be able to coordinate those efforts. And finally, just to, to finish, let me reiterate the commitment of the entire UN system to supporting Indonesia's inclusive and green economic transformation. And I wish us all a very productive discussion ahead. Terima kasih banyak. Thank you very much, uh, Valerie, for your support and again elaborating a certain aspects and salient results of our modeling exercise. Uh, but I think uh, just to put things a little more context and building on what you remarked that hit me a lot is the importance of resilience. As economists, we keep forgetting and we keep remaining focused on how to grow faster and faster, but don't do much in sufficient investments in protecting what we already have developed. Um, the policy packages that we analyze in macroeconomic model actually were not randomly picked. We actually analyzed the data for the line since 1960 onwards, looking at all the possible shocks, different in around four broad categories, both economic and non-economic, to tease out the lessons learned from the last 50, 60 years of experiences from the region. So which policies have stood out, which policies have worked in A, having resilience, and B, 
increasing the ability of countries to rebound from such shocks better. And that is a crux of the policy packages that we try to then feed into the modeling exercise. So it's, it, it's, it's really interesting now, I think, to see. As economists, we are basically, I think, in the game of what I always tell my team, setting narratives. And this narrative of economic transformation, the importance of it, the urgency of it now, then we are facing, as Ibu Armida was saying, climate change and many of the challenges is actually all become all the more, all the more important. The working with Indonesia and in the very, very capable leadership and colleagues from BAPANAS, given that G20 presidency is also with Indonesia, to me, it's actually a great opportunity to translate that narrative of economic transformation in some very specific policy actions that Indonesia actually can recommend to the rest of the world. So the timing for this workshop for us has been extremely important and we really value our partnership um, as this, uh, with Bepanas and as Valerie was saying, with her colleagues and her team, I think Deandra has been very actively working with UNDP and many other UN colleagues. So all of UN has actually come together very effectively in working and supporting Indonesia's effort. So let me now turn to our uh, special guest today, um, Ms. Amelia Vidyasanti, as Ibu Bini, everybody calls her, the Deputy Minister for Economic Affairs, Ministry of National Development and Planning, Mapanas. Her Excellency, the Thank floor. You. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and Bahamza Malik. Nice to meet you again here uh, online. And Her Excellency, Ibu Armida uh, Ali Shahbana, Executive Secretary of UNESCO. Uh, Ibu Farari, UN Resident Coordinator, and everyone who join us here in this today uh, uh, meeting, uh, I would like to really say thank you, first of all, to UNESCO and the UN uh, for collaborating with, with us, especially in this very, uh, very uh, important topic uh, regarding to green economy and how Indonesia will transform economy. And one of the strategies is actually Green economy. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as you know that Indonesia has a vision to escape from middle income trap in 2045. So, but the thing is that if we would like to achieve our target for escaping from the middle income trap in 2043, then Indonesia need to grow at the rate on average of 6% yearly and this is not easy meaning that we have to really put our high effort to really collaborate with everyone so our ambition to be a high income economy uh, in 2043 can be achieved so with that indonesia in in this case is ministry of national development planning really uh, release and try to redesign the Indonesian economic transformation that have been mentioned uh, by Ibu Valerie and Ibu Almide and also by uh, Pa Hamza, that we have the six big strategies to achieve uh, and to transform the Indonesian economy in the future. So one of the strategy is green economy. Uh, as we know that after COVID-19, that it is very important for every country to really, to really pursue the green recovery. And we know that green economy is actually a new opportunities for everyone and for every country. So that's why uh, in Indonesian green, Indonesia development strategic sector for green economy, we would like to put our effort on energy transition, clean transportation, sustainable forest, sustainable land and agriculture, sustainable uh, water resources, circular economy and also blue economy uh, that will that where blue economy will be one of Indonesia to engine of economic growth in the future. And uh, for your information that Indonesia in this case, Papanas would like to collaborate with you and UNESCO on how uh, we can transform our economy based on these six uh, strategies. And for your information, that uh, Indonesia already started uh, the, 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 the preparation of master plan of economic transformation 
uh, through the launching of Bali Economic Transformation that was launched in December 3rd, 2021 by our president. So we started the, uh, the master plan of Indonesian economic transformation through Bali Economic Transformation Agenda. Because as you know that Bali is one of uh, the provinces in Indonesia that uh, the worst impacted from the COVID-19. So with that, uh, this is actually our big agenda. Uh, we would like to really implement the, the Indonesian economic transformation together with everyone, including with UN and UNESCO. Uh, for your Indonesia, for your information, Indonesia is really vulnerable to the climate change. You know that uh, we are very risky to water scarcity, and uh, and also we have risk on land ecosystem damage, uh, and also we are really uh, to marine ecosystem damage, health quality decrease, and food scarcity. So meaning that climate change may increase the risk of uh, Indonesian uh, disaster. And also it, is, it can be uh, economic potential losses for Indonesia. As we know that if we don't really mitigate this risk, then the potential losses that Indonesia will experience is around 0.7 to 3.5% of the GDP in 2030. So we have to really put our effort to, to mitigate this risk. And uh, furthermore, we would like to optimize the transition of Indonesian economy towards the green economy. And for that, uh, we have the systemic green policy framework. And uh, the framework policy is actually really put and how that Indonesian national strategy can really match and really align with the global strategy. Uh, so meaning that our policy instruments, uh, our policy instruments have to really uh, align with the global standard and also the uh, global architecture on this green economy. And for your information also, we are trying to implement green economy by, uh, uh, enhancing the collaboration between uh, stakeholders in Indonesia, such as public, private, and also uh, other stakeholders. So with that, we can really put the orchestration of this uh, implementation of green economy, uh, not only with the national stakeholders, but also we would like to really engage a lot with international stakeholders in this regard. So for that, uh, uh, BAPANAS, really appreciate UNESCO for collaborating uh, to build better uh, with BAPANAS. And as you know, uh, the objective of BAPANAS and UNESCO collaboration is actually to design uh, and to implement the, 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 the modeling that is not only addressing the potential economic impacts of adverse shocks, but also uh, how that we can change the economic dire uh, policy direction that really can enhance the potential of a green economy to the Indonesian economic growth in the future. So in this, uh, uh, our collaboration with UNESCO will be very, useful and very beneficial for BAPANAS. Uh, as BAPANAS in this regard in my unit is that responsible to design the uh, economic policy for Indonesia, in the, uh, not only in the short term, but also for the medium and the long term. In this regard, the modeling that is developed with UNESCO and will be applied and implemented by BAPANAS will be very valuable to contribute to uh, uh, be the input about the policy scenario and to choose and to have to really help the policymakers uh, to to really choose which one is the policy scenario is uh, is more uh, better and also to allow uh, any assessment of 
social and environmental impacts of uh, public policies alongside with the macroeconomic impacts and also uh, the benefit the benefit of the tool uh, that will be uh, implemented by BAPENAS through the collaboration with the UNESCO is to assess the issues related to macroeconomic uh, issues such as tax sustainability and so on. So with this, uh, I would like to really say that the model really support the establishment of integrated policy to achieve 2030 agenda for sustainable development and also in this regard to achieve the vision of Indonesia 2045 and to really uh, implement the green economy through the modeling and through the policy uh, design uh, in Indonesia. And uh, for your information, uh, this model will further elaborate on the carbon tax channel to develop scenarios uh, that explore the impact of channeling revenue generated from the carbon tax into key policy areas and also interactions between forest cover preservation and emissions from land use change and forestry uh, will also be captured. Uh, this will be very uh, also potential to explore how much is the returns can be uh, obtained from the ecological fiscal transfer scheme. I'll stop there. And again, I would like to really appreciate the collaboration between uh, BAPANAS and UNS Cup and also the support from the UN and BAPANAS will stand ready to work together with UNS Cup and UN for the economic transformation agenda of Indonesia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ibu Wini, for a sharing the details of priorities of Indonesian government and the work that BAPANAS under your leadership has already done the synergies that that work has with our bodily exercise. So the collaboration actually is turning out to be very, very fruitful in those current, current, uh, current circumstances. And we hope to continue to support Indonesia as we move forward in translating the findings of the model into actual practical policy actions, including the ones you once that talk about implications such as for debt sustainability and so on and so forth. So I think uh, colleagues, participants, uh, this has been fairly beneficial, a big aggregate big picture view of a what this workshop is about, what kind of challenges our region, Indonesia, and globally are being faced, what work is going on in Dapanas and in, in, in ASCAP regarding the, in, in, in this context. So I hope it will be beneficial. Let me now hand over to my colleague, uh, uh, Rohimat Roni. He is the head of sub regional office for Southeast Asia to moderate the next session where we're going to get into, as I shared earlier, into talking about Indonesia's medium-term development opportunities and challenges a little more detail, uh, as uh, Ibu Vini just uh, outlined them. Then we'll be uh, hearing about what work as a whole UN system is actually doing in Indonesia. And lastly, we'll hear uh, from Don Holland about the key results of the socioeconomic and environment impacts of different policy scenarios that emerge from our modern exercise for Indonesia. Okay, so Ronnie, the floor is yours. Ronnie, can you hear me? Okay, thank you, Hamza. There okay. you go, thank you. I was uh, muted for a while. Well, uh, may I May I greet everyone a good afternoon to all participate, uh, participants at this national workshop. Uh, we are joined here by participants from not only from uh, Southeast Asia, but uh, registered are also participants from the Pacific, Europe, and the Middle East. So welcome, uh, welcome everyone to this national workshop. So we will proceed with uh, session two, uh, building Indonesia forward uh, better policy options and implications. So this session will review Indonesia's major development opportunities and challenges and discuss the socioeconomic and environmental implications of selected policy options to achieve a more inclusive, resilient and green development. Uh, I am Ruhimat Surakusuma or Ronnie for short, uh, head of the sub-regional office for Southeast Asia at ESCAP and I will be moderating uh, this session. Uh, we've heard at the opening session uh, from the remarks that sustainability, sustainability is key 
to the COVID-19 pandemic and economic recovery of the country, Indonesia. The promotion of quality of life and well-being underscores the importance of a strong public health care system. Building back better will rely on the economy that is driven by sustainable and environmentally friendly sectors, both in public and in private. Equally important is to address the inequality caused by the pandemic and to promote inclusivity and resilience in the communities and among its people. So this afternoon, we have four speakers representing government and the UN to speak on three topics that will delve into the strategy, approaches, and challenges faced by Indonesia in building forward better. Uh, the first presentation will be from Bapa Eka Chandra Buana of the Ministry of National Development Planning uh, Indonesia, or BAPENAS, followed by Ibu Diandra Pratami of the United Nations Resident Coordinator Office in Indonesia, and Ibu Ferania Andrea of the UNDP. And finally, from Ms. Uh, Ms. Dawn Holland uh, of UNSCAP. Uh, following the presentations, we will open the floor uh, for questions. So everyone is welcome uh, to type uh, the questions uh, in the chat box. Uh, so let us begin uh, with the session. May I invite uh, Bapa Eka Chandra Buana, who is the Director for Macro, for macro Planning and Statistical Analysis at BAPENAS to present on Indonesia's medium-term development opportunities and challenges. So pa, pa, pa Chandra, uh, economic recovery from COVID-19 presents unique challenges to the government. What is the Indonesian government doing to take the opportunity to catalyze the economic and societal transformation that will tackle climate change, environmental, uh, sorry, environmental, uh, issues and build jobs, livelihood, and prosperity. Uh, Pak Chandra, please. Okay, uh, thank you, Pak Roni. Good afternoon, uh, Professor uh, Armida, uh, Ibu Winnie, Deputy Minister of Economic Affairs, uh, Mr. Valerie, and uh, distinguished uh, speakers, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, to begin my presentation, I would like to share about the uh, global uh, mega trends of uh, 2045 as opportunity and challenges in carrying out uh, sustainable and equitable development. As a challenge, uh, Indonesian and, uh, Indonesia needs to uh, identify human resources uh, needs, uh, technology, uh, global demography, educational tra uh, and training, uh, human resources, and if it uh, success, uh, taking advantage about the, democratic, uh, the demographic bonus. Uh, apart from that, another factor that needs uh, to be considered and a focus at this time is a climate change. Indonesia have, uh, has started to design development uh, development in RPGM, uh, Medium Term Development Plan, 2020-2024, uh, most uh, more sustainable uh, recovery strategy, strategies, uh, and the area that needs to uh, be transformed that we will that we will discuss uh, in more detail today. Set from number four, please. As uh, Ibu, uh, Ibu uh, Winnie mentioned, Indonesia have vision to be developed country before 2045, making it to be uh, the seventh highest GDP, uh, GDP in the world. This achievement uh, certainly requires a supportive economic design. Looking back on the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which uh, had shaken the economy, uh, Indonesia needs uh, to recover stronger with a sustainable economic recovery plan. <clears throat> in the post-COVID-19 recovery, Indonesia will pursue its economic growth target of 5.4% uh, until 2025, with the annual growth until 2045 at 6%. As the economy growth, the middle, in, the middle class also grow uh, with the projection to, uh, of 223 million people in 2045. There are four important pillars in Indonesia development toward the 2045 vision. One of the main focuses uh, in current development is sustainable economic development. Sustainable economic development is expected to be mainstream in various sectors. In this case, uh, the government focuses on uh, sustainable development consists of foreign trade and investment, industry and tourism, maritime economy, food security and farmer welfare, energy and water resistance and commitment to the environment. Then uh, 
Indonesia needs to have a medium long term development projection and stages to achieve 2045 development target. In the first place, uh, in the first place, uh, it will focus on changing the economy structure that is uh, more productive and environment friendly, which a target uh, of reaching 5.2 percent per year. In the second stage, it is necessary to accelerate uh, investment in industrial manufacturing growth. At this stage, uh, this, it is uh, necessary to accelerate uh, investment and in industrial manufacturing growth. Uh, and the third stage is about the economic modernization by prioritizing uh, quality and sustainable uh, growth. This is, uh, we have a target for average growth, uh, growth about that 6.7% per year. After going uh, through uh, these stages, Indonesia will achieve not only a high growth, but also a more equitable growth. As directed by uh, the 2045 vision, higher growth will be mainly contributed by Eastern Indonesia, while maintaining the growth momentum in uh, Western region. Thus, uh, the Western uh, uh, Indonesia will contribute up to 25.1% of Indonesian national GDP. This is a significant increase compared to its current contribution is only 17.5%. Uh, uh, its, its region will be developed based on their uh, unique economic potential. You can see about in uh, about uh, uh, strategy uh, based on this slide. Next slide, please. As an effort to realize the 2045 uh, vision, Indonesia has the following target in the RPGM 2020-2024. Uh, this is uh, uh, about the economic growth, uh, which is about uh, 5.2 until 6% per year. But uh, because of uh, pandemic, uh, the economic shock in 2020 caused the Indonesian economy to experience negative growth for the first time in two decades. In 2021, uh, the Indonesian economy has returned to positive 3.7%, uh, uh, surprised the, the level of uh, GDP before pandemic. In 2021, uh, poverty rate has fallen again to 9.71%. Uh, this is uh, below uh, two digits uh, because if 2020, uh, this is a, a two, uh, double digit. Uh, the unit ratio reaches about that 0 0.360 uh, until 0 0.374. Currently, Indonesia unit ratio reaches about that, uh, 0 0.381 as of September 2021. The open employment rate reaches uh, reach about that 3.6% uh, until 4.3%. The uh, COVID pandemic had caused unemployment in Indonesia to increase to 7.07%. About the uh, climate, the reducing uh, greenhouse gases emission by 27.3%, uh, Indonesia in the Paris Agreement has committed to reduce uh, greenhouse uh, gases emission by 29% by 2030. This step has been initiated uh, and will be optimized through economic transformation toward the uh, sustainable economy. The COVID pandemic, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, has had uh, also a major impact on social economic condition, not only in the short term but also in the medium uh, long term. In the short term, the impact of uh, COVID-19 uh, in 2020 cost contraction in economic growth in each component, such as consumption, investment, and export. Other impacts cause a, a decrease in per capita income, decreased production capacity, and bankruptcy is several in of several business uh, uh, dominated by small, uh, uh, micro, small, medium enterprises. The implication of this is uh, an increase in employment and poverty rate. One of the uh, one of the causes about the increase in property rate is the large number of middle in middle class who is included in the uh, vulnerable category. 
while mo most businesses experience a significant decline in income, thereby uh, reducing uh, the number of workers. In the medium uh, until uh, long term, uh, the impact of COVID-19 in the medium will be persistent, especially in the tourism sector. Moreover, uh, worker begins to experience a shift to the low productivity and informal sector. One of the phenomena that occurs and uh, need to be reviewed is the increasing trend of gig economy. This the shift in labor needs uh, to be considered, so of, so that uh, potential of resources can be optimal in carrying uh, in carrying out development. Health quality is not. Uh, is still not improving due to uh, COVID-19 and rising, rising uh, poverty rates. In addition, uh, COVID-19 uh, limit potential deployment of renewable energy. Set, uh, next slide, please. Okay. The COVID-19 pandemic has different uh, has a different post-pandemic impact from previous pandemic. The post-COVID-19 world has changed many sectors. First, about, uh, about the acceleration of digitalization and automation. Digitalization uh, moved expo exponentially during the pandemic, giving rise uh, to new opportunity and challenges uh, in various sectors. Artificial intelligence and big data are becoming important and accelerating during the COVID-19 period. Changes to global value chains. The pandemic condition, uh, which had uh, various limitations at the time, made many parties innovate in the supply chains to continue to achieve uh, the target that have been set. The rising telework trends is also a new trend that uh, developed uh, during the pandemic. Green recovery, uh, uh, this is the uh, most important after COVID. The economic has fallen during a pandemic, so it needs a recovery. The con this condition uh, is a momentum to realize sustainable development with a green economy design that the government has begun to implement in stage. Uh, next slide, please. Post -COVID, uh, in the post-COVID, economic growth is expected to increase uh, greenhouse gases emission again, along with the uh, increasing production activities and community mobility. This needs to be anticipated before a spike in greenhouse gas emission occur. This should be uh, noted that uh, Indonesia will face climate change, and Indonesia is quite vulnerable in climate change. Uh, this makes Indonesia face a food crisis and uh, resource scarcity. I think this is uh, the issue that we have to take out. To take out. Uh, next slide, please. This is about that, uh, how to uh, the framework, how to we uh, recover about uh, and toward the economic transformation. Economic uh, uh, transformation needs to be done to achieve sustainable growth, and so, uh, economic transformation is needed to improve uh, the tra uh, economic trajectory, not only return uh, to its pre pandemic level, but to increase sustainability. Compared to uh, economic recovery, which focuses on creating supply and demand, economic transformation provides intervention on total factor productivity, capital productivity, and labor productivity. Next slide, please. This is uh, uh, the slide uh, uh, as Bu uh, Winnie mentioned. Sustainable development and redesign of the economic transformation are framed to six game changers uh, strategies. Each strategy should on a build forward better with uh, SDGs as the main instrument of each strategy. Next slide, please. Uh, in the effort to support sustainable economic uh, recovery, it is important to divide its horizon uh, impact. The short term horizon will focus on uh, provide the responsible, uh, responsive health system, job creation, and accelerate the eco uh, recovery of. Uh, economic activity. Meanwhile, in the medium term, the green stimulus package is implemented in uh, the context of economic recovery. This requires innovative, innovative funding and sound recovery strategies. In the long term, uh, it will focus on the improvement of the 
long term growth potential, improve the resilience to the uh, future shock, and decrease carbon emission. However, there are still big issues that need uh, to be tackled to achieve a, a sustainable path. The, exploit the exploitation uh, of resource, uh, the economy, has to lead to environment degradation. Continuing uh, Indonesian unsustainable development path will limit Indonesia's uh, growth, job creation, and poverty reduction potential. Extra extractive uh, economic, cre economic creates a lot of losses to Indonesia uh, natural resources, which include water uh, and water pollution, uh, the shrinking uh, forest area, and environment degradation in general. Next slide, please. Uh, a green economy is a concept that is considered appropriate in overcoming, overcoming uh, environment pro uh, environmental program, uh, problems, climate change, and economic construction due to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. The green economic development framework is focused on decarbonization, resource efficiency, and environment, environment, uh, environment improvement. The green economy is also designed to uh, to improve the uh, people's quality of life through cleaner air and more secure available of other resources. The social impacts uh, that can be achieved include reducing poverty and unemployment due to the creation of new jobs and social inclusion. Indonesia, uh, Indonesia needs a, a long-term uh, policy commitment to the transition to a sustainable and low carbon economy that support industrial uh, strategies recovery. The pandemic has affected the industrial sector significantly and manufacturing sector is among uh, the, the top five sector in Indonesia economy. The share of industry is around uh, 20% of GDP. Several strategic sector whose transformation in, is uh, central to development of first about the a green economy that covered cleaner industrial process. The second one about the supply chain, so electricity uh, generation and other industrial processes. The third one about the demand sector, which requires energy efficiency. Next slide, please. This is about the uh, most of the country infrastructure, particularly the long life ones is classified as climate sensitive, highly vulnerable uh, to destruction from natural disaster, just uh, requiring careful planning. Climate resilient infrastructure development adapted to unpredictable, unpredictable climatic condition in the future can reduce the risk of costly impact that may occur due to climate change. There are a potential risk of natural disaster in Indonesia. Therefore, uh, the development of climate resilient infrastructure is critical to be incorporated in the long-term development planning. Investing in the sustainable management uh, promote a more sustainable consumption and production activity. Uh, previous slide, please. Yes, okay. Uh, production, production activities of circular economy, which reduce potential waste generated in the whole supply chains. Slide number 23, please. Okay, uh, let's now deep, deep, um, let's now deep uh, dive to green economy strategy, one of economic uh, transformation strategy. There are a uh, strategy sector carrying out economic transformation, namely uh, energy transition, clean transportation, sustainable land and farming, sustainable forest, sustainable water resources, circular economy through waste management and blue economy for sustainable marine and coastal environment. Next slide, please. Uh, this is this R sector. There is R sector A, electricity, electricity uh, and heat uh, generation, uh, transportation and industry. Greenhouse uh, gas emission generated from power plants that uh, are the largest and continue the increase in the last 10 years. Based on this slide, this, uh, there are three policy directives to 
uh, energy transition. First about the new renewable energy transition and new uh, energy efficiency. Improvement of uh, new uh, renewable energy supporting the industry. The third one about the reduced carbon emission and increased value added gradually. The second strategic sector is about the clean transportation. Uh, the growth of motorized vehicle has increased rapidly in the last five years, which have uh, which has a uh, contribute uh, air pollution and increasing uh, greenhouse gas emission. The policy directive on clean transportation should focus on uh, improving uh, urban and national air quality, uh, meeting clean energy needs, and improve the mass transportation system. Next slide. The third strategy uh, focus about on sustainable forest. Forestry sector emission tend to be dominant in the last decade. Land clearing activities are indicated to be the main cause of forest, uh, forest fires. The policy directive on sustainable forests will focus restoring and conserve, uh, conserving few, uh, forest uh, resource, carrying out uh, sustainable forest monitoring and sustainable use uh, of forests. Next slide, please. The fourth strategy sector is about uh, sustainable agriculture and land. The country of Indonesia, uh, Brazil, China, account for 50% of global emission from agricultural activities. Uh, meanwhile, the main causes of Indonesia agriculture sector emission comes from reforestation and peatland fires of, uh, for the land change. Therefore, uh, the policy directive on sustainable uh, agriculture and land including improving sustainable uh, agriculture and improving the integrated farming system. Uh, next slide, okay. Uh, the fifth uh, start, uh, study sector is about that sustainable water resources. Water shortage have begun to threaten uh, uh, economic activity, especially those concentrated in urban area. Wasteful use of water, uncoordinated development, and pollution exacerbate the pressure on the carrying capacity, carrying capacity of water in river and groundwater basins that should have the high economic level. Overuse of the groundwater causes the rapid depletion of the groundwater uh, table, table and can lead to long-term water shortage. Policy directive on sustainable water resource include improve water quality by reducing pollution, discharge and waste uh, in water bodies, achieving integrated water resource management, and improve access to safe and affordable drinking water for household. The six strategies about the blue economy uh, for the marine and coastal environment. Indonesia uh, marine based economy has grown significantly with the enormous potential, although uh, its management is not yet optimal. The development marine and fishery, fishery, the gov government needs to properly manage the domestic fleet and improve national fishery logistic management and develop uh, fishermen resources. The policy directive on the blue economy for sustainable marine and coastal environment will focus on increase the sustainable economic benefit of fishery and marine tourism economic activity, improving, in sustain <clears throat> improving sustainable management for marine and coastal ecosystem, and ending practices of overfishing illegal and destructive fishery activities. The last strategy is circular economy through better waste management. The amount of the food waste uh, and waste in Indonesia is correlated with loss the, of the four until five percent of economic output, which uh, most of the which come from the household consumption stage. The policy directive on circular economy through waste management include the reduction in waste and improve uh, plastic waste management. Before uh, I end my presentation, I would like to uh, make uh, some uh, conclusion. Uh, economic activity uh, generates environment pressure through production, distribution, uh, transport, and waste generation, include greenhouse gas emission. 
and therefore uh, there are there is a need of coordination and collaboration for the policy and funding from all stakeholders, both of government and community. In this regard, COVID-19 pandemics is a game changer that we can ask to grow better with improving uh, productivity and being more inclusive and suitable. We must uh, take this momentum to transform our economy. Through the redesigned economic transformation econo uh, strategy, Indonesian growth trajectory is not only expected to uh, back to uh, its pre-pandemic, but also to lift to higher level or in the sustainable path. Economic transformation requires involve, involvement uh, from cross-sectoral uh, cross 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 and cross-regional, as well as cross-level uh, of government. For that, let us work together to realize a greener, more resilient, and sustainable Indonesia. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waikum salam. Thank you very much, Pak Chandra, for the overview of uh, Indonesia's uh, medium uh, medium term sustainable development agenda. Uh, may I now invite uh, for the next presentation uh, the next presentation on uh, the UN uh, support to green development in Indonesia. Uh, may I ask uh, Ibu Diandra Pratami, Development Coordination Officer, Economist at the Office of the UN Resident Coordinator in Indonesia. So uh, Ibu Diandra leads the UN system-wide studies in the country and provides substantive inputs to the implementation of the UN Indonesia Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework 2021-2025, and then followed by Ms. Ferrania Andrea, who is Senior Advisor for Sustainable Energy with UNDP Indonesia. Uh, she has more than 15 years of working experience in clean energy, climate change, and green economy issues. So with that, uh, may I ask, how is the UN or how are the UN agencies helping Indonesia support in its development that is inclusive, resilient, and green? Uh, you have the floor, uh, Ibu Diandra. Thank you very much, Pak Roni, um, for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Diandra. I'm with the UN Resident Coordinator's Office. I'll be joined by my colleague, uh, Ibu Verania from UNDP. Uh, today, in our presentation today, we will uh, elaborate what has been um, presented by our U UN Resident Coordinator on our commitment uh, towards green development in Indonesia, uh, and then followed by different um, evidence uh, and policy recommendations that are generated through uh, a UN partnership on green economy in Indonesia. Let me briefly go through the, um, the first uh, uh, outline of, uh, of our presentation. It will be about the cooperation framework that we had signed uh, with the government of Indonesia, in this case uh, with the um, uh, Minister of National Development Planning. Uh, the UN system in the country, uh, either both resident agencies and non-resident agencies, uh, are working um, within four main outcomes area. Firstly, is in uh, around inclusive human development. Secondly, uh, inclusive economic transformation, which was just ex uh, explained before by by a previous presenter, Bapak Chandra. And then, uh, of course, we do have specific outcome on green development, climate change, and also disasters. And the last uh, outcome would be around uh, innovation for SDGs acceleration. You will see some of the areas, the focus areas that we work uh, in the country directly linked to green development, including different work, uh, different, different portfolio around renewables, um, protection of land, marine ecosystem, climate change, circular economy, different agricultural uh, 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 work, um, and then uh, some areas around, around water uh, and also food security. And of course, on financing. Uh, so we jointly, different UN system uh, had uh, what we call uh, a joint programs or joint initiatives uh, that uh, of course we do differently uh, with different uh, partners and uh, with support from different uh, development uh, uh, partners as well. So here an example that we will hear today is an action, uh, partnership action on green economy for that we do have different five UN agencies working uh, on this area. 
uh, similarly with uh, uh, renewable uh, energy, uh, food, uh, sorry, uh, I mean uh, land use and, and food system, uh, and also different uh, SDGs financing and uh, REDD or uh, reducing emission, deforestation and degradation. Uh, each agency also has their own specific uh, work in this area. We've heard uh, some of the areas mentioned by Pak Chandra before that there are uh, many of the uh, areas that the government aims to achieve, uh, uh, including different... Um, uh, here we, we mentioned that some of the UN agencies work on different areas such as energy transition, forest and land monitoring, uh, and also uh, the ones that are uh, supported by ESCAP as well are included here. So uh, we mentioned that uh, in this presentation, we would like to also show that uh, we are uh, very much in line with what has been um, uh, included in the, in the national uh, development uh, planning document for us to be able to support the government of Indonesia in achieving inclusive and green development. I would like to hand over uh, my presentation to, to the next uh, presenter, Ibu Perania in uh, some uh, evidence uh, and, and also policy recommendations generated from the Partnership for Action on Green Economy. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mbak Diandra. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, glad that we could share the experience of the Partnership for Actions on Green Economy in Indonesia, working jointly of five uh, UN agencies. Next one, please. So uh, allow me to just to uh, quote from previous um, presenters. What is actually the context, the support that the UN agencies um, doing in Indonesia in the context of green economy? The first, as we know uh, that actually UN, uh, Indonesia has committed uh, to reduce the emission reduction, the submitted uh, national determined contributions to the UNFCCC where the country commit to reduce the uh, emission reductions. Um, the energy and the forest and other land use is identified as the main uh, emission contributors. Next one. Thank you. So in response to the NDC, the government of Indonesia has actually mainstream the uh, green economy into the national midterm development plan 2020-2024 and it is famous and known as the green RPJMN. So here uh, we could see that actually the, the, inter, uh, the integration of the emission intensity and emission reduction as the development indicators um, and this has actually led uh, the sectors in the development of Indonesia to also set the targets and contribute to the achievement of the national uh, target. Next one, please. And further, uh, I also quote the uh, presentation from uh, Ibu Winnie. Here, the government has set the national priority and the government uh, program around what's so-called low carbon development uh, initiative. And it's not only focusing on the environment issue, but also the balance of social, economy, and environment indicators that has to be uh, met and um, implemented simultaneously. Next one. So um, while Indonesia is actually mainstream uh, the policy of the low carbon development um, initiative in the midterm national development plan and start to kicking out the implementation, then the green, uh, the, the COVID-19 impact the countries, not only Indonesia, but also all the other countries. Then the question is how uh, actually the implementation of the, uh, of this low carbon development can be also uh, becoming the green recovery approach. Does it really contributing to the green recovery? Um, because uh, in the previous presenter shows that there's a low, lower interest for the renewable energy investment. There is an unemployment increasing. So the investment in the low carbon development initiative becomes become question whether it's actually offering uh, something. 
uh, for recovering the country uh, from the COVID-19 impact. So while having a mainstreaming into the policy uh, and then hit by the COVID-19, um, in the implementation level, the green economy or low carbon development initiative itself face some challenges. So left alone the COVID-19, without the COVID-19 impact, the green economy implementation actually has a challenge itself. So it uh, needs a really strong leadership. It's cross-sectoral. There is a lack of the baseline uh, data that needs to be there in order to the government to make decision that can avoid the trade-off between social economy and environment. There is some limited tools in the planning uh, that allowing all the three uh, sectors actually assess in simultaneously. There's a constrained com uh, competitive fiscal space. And if you want to promote the green investment, there's still a very lack of at scale carbon technology and also infrastructure that can interest public uh, and private um, investment in that sector. So then for that, um, uh, to deal with those challenges, the UN page in Indonesia has been working with the Directorate for Environmental Affairs together with other uh, development partners, not only five uh, UN agencies, but also others with UKCCU, with the GIZ, uh, WRI, JICA, Triple GI, and other uh, development partners. We jointly support uh, what's so called LCDI framework to address the needs for the implementation of the LCDI, also in the context of uh, the COVID 19. So we will need. Um, to address uh, the need for from the government, in this case is uh, BAPANAS, on the policy at the national level, and also the policy at the regional level, because for the implementation, it's not possible only at the national level, but also at the provincial level. How can we be monitor and report and evaluate the implementation of the green economy? whether the capacity is already there for all the important stakeholders. And the last one about the financial and investment needed for the implementation of this green economy. So around these five identified needs, all uh, the five UN agencies under UN page and also other development partners work hand in hand to support the implementation. This what so-called uh, LCDI framework where we bond together and contribute. So for the UN page um, support, we focus on the energy industry and waste sector. Six of building blocks, policy, sectoral assessment, deep diving to different uh, critical sectors in the, um, in the implementation of the green economy, awareness raising and capacity building, promoting green jobs and just transition, mainstreaming uh, LCDI, and also exercising the prototyping business model at the provincial level. And the last one, as a green recovery um, strategy, the LCDI, the low carbon through circular economy. Um, this is just an example on how in every building block we have contributed hand in hand with other development agencies. There's also the introduction of the planning tool based on the system dynamic modeling developed uh, along the important sectors of the NDC, link the sector of the so, uh, social economic and also environment. And the last one that has been exercised is the, the model to assess whether the green economy or the low carbon development can be the green recovery strategy for Indonesia. So the model has been run and you could see that actually with the, with the intervention of different policy, uh, the green policies, 
you could see that the emission projections will be uh, reduced. Uh, em uh, the emission intensity will also be reduced. The GDP is, in, uh, is estimated will be increasing and also the economic growth uh, projection. So with this simulation, I think that will be nice to see the complementary uh, with the modeling that UNSCAP um, is developing as well. Next one. On the second, on the sectoral assessment, we try to understand what is actually the, the main policy in different sectors. But in here, we focus on energy, waste management, and also in industry sector. In energy in particular, we develop uh, jointly with Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources, the deeper modeling for different scenario of energy policy. And to see how the, sub, uh, the sectoral uh, policy can also influence the national LCDI um, policy and uh, in overall. And the waste management, the food loss and waste, is also conducted at the provincial level following the result of the food loss waste uh, mapping at the national level. The green industry resource efficiency is one of the critical indicator for the green economy. So we conducted the study on the resource efficiency in fertilizer and cement industries. So the expectation is of course the more understanding at the, uh, at the sectoral level can be inputted to the national model to make it even more uh, in closer to the reality and in alignment between the sectoral policy and the national uh, targets and national policy. The third one, awareness raising. There are many initiative of the assessment of need for capacity to be built in order for the implementation of the green economy and knowledge exchange, different uh, Indonesia green economy uh, modeling uh, courses and also the awareness raising, including uh, different kind of stakeholders have been conducted. Next one, please. The green job and just transition we exercise in collaboration with ILO expertise to start to understand, map out what is actually the policy framework for the just transition uh, in energy sector in Indonesia. So the expectation from this is still an ongoing uh, study that we could see where is the policy gap that needs to be strengthened in energy sector in order to tap the opportunity and anticipate the, the unwanted um, impact due to the transition towards green economy. Next one, please. At the work, uh, the building block on the LCDI um, mainstreaming at the provincial level, we particularly have worked with the West Java province to develop the LCDI model for the provincial level, mirroring the approach of the national modeling. Then we work with the data and uh, in collaboration with BAPEDA, is in the provincial development plan agencies to develop LCDI for West Java, developing different scenarios on the green economy at the provincial level. We identified um, several green activities that can be promoted as the, as the first example to understand how much is the investment needed, how, how the institutions can be established and so on. So we work, for example, for the solar PV rooftop program with the West Java government for the school buildings and build around the business model for the investment. Six. Next one is a, the last one is about the green recovery through circular economy. While at the national level, um, we see that the focus is on the waste management, 
but based on the circular economy opportunity uh, for Indonesia, uh, this is based on the study supported by the Danish embassy um, through UNDP. We identified the study so there are five sectors that are more uh, that are potential for the implementation of circular economy and can give a benefit uh, for the green recovery as uh, expected. So it's a food and beverages, textile, construction, wholesale and retail, electrical and electronic equipment. So the biggest one, the food and beverages. Now ongoing study is to uh, zoom in along the food and beverages uh, supply chains where the circularity is the most impacting for the green recovery. So the expectation is not only uh, the waste as a focus, but we also would like to understand where along the supply chains, the intervention for circularity can be introduced and impact uh, the improvement of job, income, and also uh, for the environment. So that's, this is my last slide. So along the lesson learned that we have been collected since 2019, working on this green economy with BAPANAS, the green economy implementation requires co commitment from everyone at every level of decision-making. That's why we are very pleased to collaborate with all UN agencies and also development partners in supporting the government of Indonesia. Thank you, Parani. Okay, thank you, uh, Ibu Rara, for the presentation of UN support or collaboration with uh, the Indonesian government uh, in terms of uh, the sustainable recovery or development. So uh, with that, uh, again, may I ask everyone uh, uh, to please post your questions. We, we already have some questions and we will take them up after uh, the session. So, uh, and, and oh yes, and I'd like to also inform that all the presentations will be provided uh, at the website. So don't worry, uh, we will all provide a copy. Uh, so our next uh, presenter on the socioeconomic and environmental impacts of policy scenarios in Indonesia uh, will be by Ms. Dawn Holland, who is a senior consultant on macroeconomic modeling for UNSCAP and is a fellow of the National Institute of Economic and Social Research in London. So uh, we have used this modeling for a number of countries, uh, including uh, Mongolia, Nepal, and Indonesia. And so may I request Don to share the results of this macroeconomic uh, modeling uh, developed by ESCAP on recovery planning to help inspire accelerated action on using recovery spending for addressing economic and environmental challenges. Uh, Don, you have the floor, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, and it's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to share with you some of the uh, modeling and policy scenario results um, that were produced as part of the joint project between ESCAP and the UN country team for Indonesia and BAPANAS. Um, and I'd also like to say a special thank you to um, Vacherin Ziraman Nathan from ESCAP, who um, has um, really helped to push this, uh, this project forward. Um, so um, the scenarios that I'd like to share are an application of the ESCAP macroeconomic model uh, for uh, Indonesia, which, as Hamza said in his introductory remarks, was developed um, by the macroeconomic policy and analysis section at ESCAP to support the design of economic recovery packages um, for countries in the Asia and Pacific region post COVID. And for this project, um, the model was tailored to the Indonesian economy to capture some specific um, country uh, specific features, particularly rated, um, related to the green economy. And it can be viewed um, alongside uh, a, a, a contribution alongside the various other modeling um, exercises that were uh, summarized um, by uh, Varania. Um, so the ESCAP macroeconomic model, it's a global model. 
Um, so it has about 60 individual country and regional models, including a model of Indonesia, of course. Uh, and the countries are all linked together via trade and other interactions. And the foundations of the model are built upon a very standard macroeconomic framework, but we've introduced to that um, additional channels for to capture the key some key social and environmental indicators as well, so that we can look more holistically at development rather than focus just on the macroeconomy. Um, in terms of the basic structure, so we build it around this um, standard macroeconomic framework. We add a model of poverty, which depends on income and after tax and transfer in um, inequality measures. And we model emissions and air pollution, which depend on economic activity, energy efficiency of production, the energy mix, and for Indonesia, also the forest cover so that we can look at both emissions from energy use and emissions from land use change. And all of the individual country and regional models are linked together through trade, through remittances, through financial markets, as well as global carbon emissions and energy markets. So before sharing the results, let's um, review exactly what do we mean by policy scenarios. So the scenarios are developed relative to a baseline set of assumptions. So what we're trying to do is isolate the impact of changing a single or a set of specific assumptions. So, for example, we can look at the impact of uh, new government spending programs or the introduction of a carbon tax or sudden unexpected rise in the oil price, as we've seen uh, uh, recently. Um, and in terms of interpreting the results, we generally um, assess the, the, the results in terms of their difference, their percentage difference from the baseline value, rather than in level terms. So that's how um, the results that I'll share should be, um, should be viewed and interpreted. Uh, so the scenarios that we include in this study include implementing a carbon tax and implementing ecological fiscal transfers to preserve forest cover. Um, and let me just talk through very briefly the channels of transmission that are incorporated um, for these two specific policy um, instruments within the model framework. So if we look at the um, transmission of a carbon tax through the model, so and we can also think of a carbon subsidy um, in, in similar terms, um, but would with the sort of um, as a sort of negative tax, so it would have the opposite impacts of a carbon tax. So when we set a carbon tax, this first increases the costs of production, which causes um, higher consumer prices, and it also squeezes the profits of farms and squeezes investment. Um, so the, the carbon, cost, um, carbon price increases the costs of burning fossil fuels, encouraging a shift in the composition of energy towards lower carbon and no carbon energy sources. The decline in fossil fuel use uh, reduces emissions and pollution, which brings health benefits, and that helps to raise productivity and potential output over the medium term, which partially offsets um, the impacts, uh, the negative impacts of the higher energy prices. And the third important channel is that a carbon price can generate fiscal revenue, um, which can be used um, in a variety of ways. It can be channeled back into the economy to um, support new uh, spending programs or else used to pay off uh, existing debts or to implement tax cuts elsewhere. So the model was designed to explore these different types of uh, policy scenarios. So the second set of scenarios focuses on ecological fiscal transfers. So that's um, uh, transfers that are allocated in proportion to a region's success, if you like, in, uh, in 
uh, in environmental protection or in preserving uh, forest cover. So when we um, introduce uh, a, uh, the ecological fiscal transfer, we treat that as a cost um, to, the, uh, to the central government. So it's a net cost um, to the general government balance and the fiscal balance would be expected to deteriorate. Um, but the transfer encourages spending on environmental protection and forest preservation. This supports economic activity and jobs in these sectors uh, and also reduces air pollution, um, reduces tree cover loss and the decline, these declines um, raise uh, labor productivity um, with, while the decline in tree cover loss reduces the emissions from land use change. So those are the main transmission channels within the model that we are trying to capture. So with that in mind, um, I'll share some of the, just highlight some of the key results. Um, so I know we'll want to get on to uh, discussion and questions. Um, so first we look at the short term, a short term policy initiative, um, what would be the impact of the um, carbon tax um, that um, was due to be uh, implemented in uh, next month. So this is a very small tax and it's applied to a small share of total greenhouse gas emissions. So obviously on its own, a tax of this magnitude can only make very small progress towards emission reduction targets. But the key thing to keep in mind um, is that the introduction of the tax marks a really important step towards establishing the institutional and administrative, administrative framework that's needed for um, a carbon tax scheme. So having that in place will make it much easier to introduce more ambitious carbon pricing schemes in the future. So we next look at the impact of withdrawing carbon linked subsidies, which we've estimated are equivalent to about $10 per ton of energy linked CO2 emissions uh, in uh, Indonesia. Now this would have a small temporary impact on inflation, but would generate some fiscal space equivalent to over 3% of GDP by 2030. So channeling some of this space towards social protection could offset the costs of the higher inflation, particularly on vulnerable households. In subsequent scenarios, we consider a range of different uh, programs that could be financed by a more ambitious carbon pricing policy, specifically looking at both removing carbon subsidies and gradually introducing a carbon tax that rises to 40, uh, $60 per ton of CO2 by 2040. Um, and the key message here is that there, um, one spending program isn't necessarily better or worse than another, um, so that the, um, uh, the, the policies can be aligned with government priorities. For example, spending on social protection reduces inequality and poverty. Spending on environmental protection builds resilience against climate change, reduces emissions, reduces tree cover loss. Spending on health improves out health outcomes, raises labor productivity, um, et cetera. Um, so the figures here we've compared to sort of make that point, the impacts of different spending programs um, that were that have been introduced alongside um, the ambitious carbon tax program on key variables. So we can see that the impacts on GDP are highest when spending is channeled towards infrastructure, towards education, and towards health. But job creation is stronger. Um, when funds are channeled towards energy efficiency and renewable sectors, which are more labor intensive than the fossil fuel sectors. Uh, and then the impacts on poverty are greatest when uh, the, um, the funds are channeled towards, CO, um, towards social protect, protection. While CO2 emissions could be expected to fall um, more uh, when the revenue is spent on environmental protection. 
Another set of um, interesting scenarios that we run um, compares the impact of introducing a unilateral, unilateral carbon tax in Indonesia to a global coordinated carbon pricing system worldwide. We can also look at a regional um, carbon pricing system. And there are clearly enormous gains to be made from a coordinated global policy, um, both in terms of uh, reducing global emissions, but then global economic spillovers would also be expected to essentially double the positive returns on um, Indonesia's GDP, partly as a result of the slowdown in climate change that would be uh, expected alongside a global policy. Um, and in the next set of scenarios, um, we demonstrate that an ecological fiscal transfer scheme would encourage the conservation and restoration of forests, would reduce air pollution, would reduce emissions from land use change. Um, but we also warn that if uh, the transfer scheme were financed um, by issuing government debt, this could put upward pressure on the risk premium and squeeze out private sector investment. So in our final um, sort of combined green economy scenario, if you like, um, we, uh, we finance the ecological fiscal transfer scheme out of the introduction of the carbon tax and also channel some of the carbon revenue into uh, social protection. So here we see the sort of net impacts where we see GDP rising. We expect a small rise in inflation, but not by more than 0.4 percentage points um, in any year. Household incomes are supported by the social transfers um, financed through the carbon tax, supporting household consumption and declines in poverty and inequality. A greenhouse gas emissions are expected to um, decline substantially by about 14% in 2030 and 29% by 2045, making significant progress towards emission reduction targets. Pollution also expected to decline significantly, um, supporting productivity growth going forward. So I'll leave you with just um, a few uh, um, summary takeaways. Taxing carbon will increase inflation temporarily, but also has the potential to generate um, significant fiscal revenue. If carbon revenue is channeled back into the economy, it can increase economic activity, reduce inequality and poverty, while simultaneously making progress towards emission targets and reducing air pollution. And a combined green economy scenario that pairs an ecological fiscal transfer scheme with the introduction of a carbon tax can generate um, sufficient space um, to deliver important environmental uh, returns while simultaneously supporting economic activity and social progress. So thank you very much. I'll stop there. Um, and thank you so much for your attention. I look forward to any discussion. Okay, thank you very much, Don, for that very comprehensive uh, review of the of the results of the macroeconomic model. So we are now open for questions. We have already one uh, addressed to uh, Ibu Diandra and uh, Ibu Rara. Uh, perhaps you can just directly respond. If you... uh, thank you, Pak Roni. So thank you for the question. This is regarding the green industrial park in the new. Um, Indonesian capital. So I think the, I could not say about the opinion, but the, uh, because we don't have yet the basis on uh, saying the opinion, but I think the, uh, when see the plan for the green industrial park, then the introduction or the, um, the compliance to the safeguards um, in the, like the safeguards indicators that should be implied to all the, the private sector that would like to invest in that green industrial park. And I think that can be implemented or imposed by the government of Indonesia. So um, the indicator that crossed the social, economic, and also the environment um, benefits can be imposed to the private sector invested in that green industrial park. The interesting question is still about the just transition and the readiness on how uh, actually the local 
communities can be benefited and be ready tap the in, uh, the opportunities that come along with that green industrial part so i think i don't know if ibu valri for example would like to propose uh, to uh, the government of indonesia that the un can uh, can contribute to assess further on how the strategy of the just transition and uh, along with the green national uh, this green industrial park that can be an opportunity because what we found from our learning um, in a small scale only in the energy sector the transition will need a preparation to uh, give all the most benefit uh, from the transition itself thank you thank you uh, don do you have any comments to that On the uh, on the um, the specific um, I, I I can't add anything on, on that. Right, thank uh, you. Okay, uh, it's all right. So Don, uh, we have in the chat box, I guess, a comment and some. Uh, so uh, if, if I can read that, if you can see that, uh, so it is a comment for Miss Holland. It seems interesting uh, the model. I'm wondering whether the model can respond to the dynamics of carbon market and other variables. Um, so thanks very much for the um, for the question. Um, so the model is designed to be very flexible. Um, so um, it, it introduces the channels, um, which can then be um, uh, in, um, manipulated in in different ways. So we have the channel for a carbon price. Now a carbon market. Um, I think is runs in a slightly uh, different, I think we're thinking of this in a slightly different way. So carbon market has um, a, a price for carbon, which is, um, uh, which is variable and rather than being set as a sort of government policy is determined um, uh, through the through market channels. So we could um, uh, apply a, a, the same sort of the same sort of channel, um, that we have could be um, applied for the um, to the pricing that was um, uh, delivered by a carbon market. What we haven't done is to sort of endogenize that. So um, if the uh, carbon market were to uh, respond to shifts in demand for different types of energy, that would not endogenously sorry for the technical terms, um, uh, um, uh, that would not automatically um, deliver a change in the prevailing carbon price in the carbon market. So that would, um, if we wanted to be able to capture those sorts of channels, uh, we would need to elaborate the model a bit further, um, but we could do it in, in a sort of so slightly um, ad hoc way by making um, um, various assumptions about how we would expect the prices to react. Okay, thank you, Don. So we still have a few minutes for uh, additional question. But before that, may I ask uh, Pa Chandra, and this is uh, something that was alluded to during the, uh, the opening. So in pursuing the national strategies, especially the, the six uh, transformational strategies. So how is Indonesia using its international platform, uh, such as G20, as was mentioned by uh, Bu Valerie, and also uh, I think COP26, and even in the sub-regional of Southeast Asia through ASEAN in terms of ensuring that it's achieved its uh, national national goals. Pa Chandra, if you can uh, elaborate a bit on that. Okay, thank you, Pa Roni. Uh, related ab about the six strategies that I have uh, mentioned before that, uh, you know, uh, uh, if we look at about uh, my our framework, we need uh, the policy, not business as usual, to increase the trajectory of growth. Uh, therefore, uh, we have uh, six strategies. First, about human resources. Uh, the second one about the uh, economic productivity, digitalization. Uh, the fourth about that, uh, what uh, green economy. This uh, the fifth about that integration of economic domestic. The last one about that uh, new capital city. Uh, how to implement that? Actually, uh, in the uh, region level, we have a, uh, have a pilot project in Bali. As you, uh, as I, uh, you, you see about that Bali have the uh, significant impact about the COVID. Until mm -hmm. now, uh, in Bali, uh, the economic still contraction. Uh, this is the, the, the difference, the, the difference between the other provinces. That's why uh, we need uh, affirmation action about the Bali. 
And you know uh, about the uh, economic transformation. This is not only uh, in the short term. Okay, we about the COVID, we need the economic recovery. But this is on the demand side. But in the uh, medium term and the long term, we need uh, uh, the several uh, policy that name said of the economic transformation. It's uh, the, the 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 concern about the, how to increase the productivity. Mm -hmm. That's why uh, uh, this is the and related the economic transformation. Uh, this is the our theme in the uh, uh, annual working plan or RKP in 2023. This is the uh, the three uh, main uh, what we call it key message. First about the economic transformation. The second one about the inclusive. The third one how to uh, strengthen about that sustainability. This is the main main and related uh, G20. Uh, this is will be uh, addressed in how to uh, uh, about this policy. How to what we call it. Uh, this made uh, this uh, this made about that our strategy to the other countries. In, in the G20, therefore, in in the uh, G20, we have the development working group. Uh, this is the set event of G20 uh, that address about that uh, economic transformation, including the Bali. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's uh, about that our plan. That uh, your question. Thank you. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you, uh, Pachandra, for that. So we are almost out of time, and uh, we would like to also hear some remarks from Bapenas before we close uh, the session. So with that, may I thank you? Uh, oh, I think, uh, let's see, maybe we can have one more if that's okay. And this is addressed to, to Don. Yes, Don, can, can, you, can you see that question? Uh, thank you very much. I'm just going to read it out so that those who aren't looking at okay. it. So could you elaborate, how does the transmission of the model run um, um, that results instantaneously increase in GDP growth? Um, okay. Uh, so uh, so the um, we're, we're looking at, a, if you like, a fiscal injection. So if you think about it as a, as a sort of fiscal stimulus. So the spending happens, the rise in government spending happens um, uh, to coincide uh, with the, uh, the, um, the revenue that's received from the carbon policy. So that is how we are, that is how the, the model delivers an instantaneous short term. It says your, think of it as your sort of short term fiscal multiplier, um, to put it in sort of technical terms. Um, uh, so that's the impact of the um, expected rise in GDP. Now, looking at the longer term, uh, the impacts will depend very crucially on how the money is spent. For example, um, if spending on uh, sort of infrastructure and education and health deliver um, a a strong um, impacts on productivity growth, extended impacts going forward, so that we get the key distinctions um, uh, over the longer term uh, through through those channels, depending on how the, uh, the the revenue is ultimately spent. I hope that explains. Thank you. All right, thank you, Don. So now allow me to to close the session, and I would like to thank uh, Ibu Rara, Ibu Diandra, uh, Pachandra, and Don. Uh, for their uh, presentation and time for this afternoon. But we, before we close uh, the session, everyone, may I now invite Her Excellency uh, Ibu Amalia uh, Widyasanti, Deputy Minister for Economic Affairs, uh, Ministry of National Development Planning, Bapenas, to deliver uh, the closing remarks. Uh, Ibu, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, Vat, uh, could you uh, assist in this? Um, I think 
we we can we, we can close then uh Lufita. I also there will be a closing uh, by Bapenas. Is there? Can you confirm that again? Um, that's what I have been informed. Uh, Lufita, if you are to that, can can you help confirm? Um, I think that's okay. I think we can okay. close. All right. All right. Well. well okay. Well, everyone. Uh, again, thank you for your participation. Uh, we will have another session tomorrow, uh, which will be uh, conducted by Don. So with that, may I uh, uh, say uh, thank you again uh, for your time and have a good uh, afternoon. Okay, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. See you all. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.